Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. I would have liked to be present today. Unfortunately, this was not possible. And doing this uh, presentation by video is also a way to save a lot on carbon emissions, which uh, beyond global inequality is one of the other challenges of the decades to come. So let me get uh, straight to the beginning of this uh, speech. My presentation is entitled Global Inequality Trends and Drivers. My name is Lucas Chancel. I'm one of the co-directors of the World Inequality Lab. This is an international research institution who, whose headquarters are based in Paris and in Berkeley, California. We operate with a network of uh, over 100 researchers located over all um, continents. In order to combine the most recent, the most transparent data sources that allow us to track income and wealth inequality, both from an international and historical perspective. So what we do is that we, com we combine national accounts, we combine tax data, we combine data that we are able to obtain from uh, uh, leaks, like the Panama Papers or the HSBC uh, leaks, in order to provide the most um, accurate picture of the evolution of inequality and of the level of inequality today. And we feel this had to be done because there is currently a gap in um, transparency when it comes to measuring and tracking income and wealth inequality. Very often, public statistics do not provide an accurate picture of inequality levels, partly because um, some flows, financial flows, are very poorly monitored across countries. This relates to tax evasion, but also partly because the statistical tools of um, national statisticians are not tailored to properly tracking inequality. Survey data, as statisticians know, um, tend to, to largely under-report, underestimate top incomes and top wealth levels. And administrative tax data is a good way to have a better information on what is happening at the top of the distribution within countries. And we now know that a lot of the action has been taking place precisely at the top of the distribution. So it is important to have the right set of statistical tools, the right amount of data, the right set of data to measure these trends. And this is what we seek to do with um, the Distributional National Accounts Project that uh, is published on the World Inequality data Database. What we seek to do is really to reconcile microeconomic, the microeconomic study of inequality with the macroeconomic uh, study of the economy. And we seek to reconcile databases, we seek to reconcile different concepts in order to provide an accurate picture of the distribution of economic growth. Um, what I'm going to show in this presentation is that um, if we look at a four, 40 years period starting in 1980, what I'll show is that despite the strong rise of emerging countries, strong growth in China, in India and all their large emerging countries, um, global inequality understood as inequality between world citizens has increased in the world over this uh, time span. And this is one of the key results of uh, our World Inequality Report published in 2018, and I will largely draw from this report in this presentation. The top 1% captured twice as much global income growth as the bottom 50% between 1980 and um, today. That being said, what is extremely important to have in mind is that the rise of inequality within countries that we observe throughout the world across different regions and across regions uh, with very different social and political organizations, um, there's a lot of variation, there's a lot of uh, variance in the trajectories that we observe. And this is what is really interesting because this is what reveals that uh, there's no fatality in this rise of inequality across countries. It 
the rise of inequality is not uh, a deterministic byproduct of globalization or of technological progress. It is really the result of policies. And it, it is really um, when we start to look at the changes in institutional frameworks, the changes in tax policies, the changes in terms of investments in education, that we're able to understand the different trajectories followed by different countries when it comes to their inequality trends and drivers. So um, the key conclusion is that policies matter a lot, but that in order to inform um, these policies and policy debates on inequality, we need more transparency on income and wealth. And we are really calling for governments, we're really calling for the United Nations, with whom we're also closely working with in the context of the revision of the next system of national accounts, to include distributional growth statistics and really to reconcile average economic growth rates, which people hear every day uh, in the news, in the media, with what really matters for individuals. So growth rates by income groups, growth rates by percentile, um, growth rates that are closer to what people actually experience in their daily lives. And this is what I will try to, to show in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, preliminary, preliminary ways on how to uh, reconcile the macro and the micro. So let me start with um, income inequality uh, across key world regions from 1982 to today. So this is the top 10% income share, very standard um, or very simple measure of inequality. In a perfectly unequal world, the top 10% income share would be 100%. In a perfectly equal world, this uh, top 10% income share would be 10%. And we see that countries start in 1980 at various levels. Bulk of countries, India, US, Canada, Russia, China, Europe, around 30%. And Russia, slightly more than 20%. What is striking here is this generalized rise of inequality across these regions, but this rise happened at very different speeds. And what is particularly interesting to show here is the contrasted trajectory between Russia, for instance, the most equal country in uh, this subset of regions up to 1991, and in just five years, it becomes the most unequal country in the world, at least one of the most unequal countries in the world. So the extent of rising inequality was uh, absolutely huge in a, in a short period of time. Another country that experienced a strong rise of inequality, but a rise that was much more progressive is um, India or the uh, USA, starting from around 30-35% for the top 10% income share, to uh, 47% in the US today and much more 56% in India, but huge rise in both uh, regions over this uh, four decades time span. And more moderate increases in China and in, and in Europe. Now, if we take um, a broader historical perspective, all these regions in 1980 are at the end uh, of what we could call a relatively low inequality period. And whether um, we think about mixed economy regimes, US, Canada and Europe, whether we think about socialist or communist economies, Russia, China or highly regulated economies like India, from the 1950s, broadly speaking, from the interwar period or the, the, the end of the Second World War to the late 1970s, all these regions went to a phase of compression of inequality and of very low inequality levels by historical standards in the late 1970s and with a rise afterwards. So the questions we might want to ask ourselves is where are these regions going to? What um, could be the new normal in terms of inequality levels? Well, in order to discuss this question, I'm adding on this graph three regions, Middle East, Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa. There is uh, the data is of um, um, not as good uh, quality uh, before the 1980s, but uh, 
evidence points towards um, the fact that these three regions did not go through this phase of inequality reduction throughout the second half of the 20th century. So income inequality levels relatively stable in these three regions, but at extreme levels. And these very high inequality regions could actually set the new horizon in terms of inequality within countries. So the question really is, uh, are these formerly low inequality regions uh, getting back to these historically extreme levels of inequality which these uh, regions experienced earlier in their historical development at the uh, beginning of the 20th century and in the 19th uh, century. Before I get back to this question of the future, let me first um, d do a, a thought experiment. What would happen to inequality in all these regions if we were breaking national boundaries. So what happens to inequality between world citizens, irrespective of their nationality? And one very powerful way to, uh, to look at this is to focus on um, so-called growth incidence curve. That is, for each group of the world population, right, from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right. And we have here 100 groups uh, of the global population. So the bottom 1% uh, to the top 1%. And uh, for each of these percentile, what we plot here is uh, the real income growth rate per adult over uh, the 1980 to 2016 period. And what comes out of this graph very nicely, very neatly, is what we could um, present as three pictures of globalization. The first picture of globalization, globalization is a relatively positive, or very positive picture. Strong growth in emerging countries, growth over 100%, doubling of incomes in real terms. So this is um, the emerging countries catching up with the West, and this is a very positive news for the global economy. Now, if we go to the right-hand side of the curve, it appears that some groups grew at a much lower level, below 50%. We'll see that in some countries, growth for the bottom half of the population, some rich countries like the US, growth for the bottom half was actually much lower than 40% was actually close to 0% over this entire time period. So this is a more negative picture of globalization. And finally, what is happening at the very right-hand side of the graph also deserves attention. Growth rates over 200% for the top 1%. And what we're really here able to show, thanks to the new combination of administrative tax data national accounts and surveys is the extent of this increase. So one might say that what is happening here at the top um, is not necessarily meaningful from a macroeconomic point of view because this only represents 1% of the global population. So in the end, perhaps we should not really care about what is happening there. And what really is important is what is happening here and, and here. Well, in order to um, answer this, this question, this remark, uh, a good way uh, to move forward is actually to present the exact same data. So that's the exact same data, except um, the scale is a bit different here. Basically, uh, we are exploding the top 1% into different subgroups. And what I'm representing on this, on, in this box is um, the fact that the top 1% itself represents 1% of the global population by definition, but captured 27% of total growth. And this is also what is illustrated on this axis, about 30%, um, a bit less, but this represents uh, much better the extent here of the growth that is captured by the top 1%. And this, is this has to be compared with the total growth captured by the bottom 50% over the period, just 12% of total growth. So about twice as much of all the new euros, the new rupees, the new yuans, the new dollars created in the world since 1980, more than twice as much 
of all this growth was captured by the top 1% itself rather than by the bottom 50%. So this is a rise, this can be translated in a rise of global inequality despite the rise of emerging countries. And this is one of the key uh, the, the key novelty, the key new results we now know about the evolution of global income dynamics over the past decades. Now, another question could be that, in fact, we needed very strong growth at the top in order to have growth at the bottom, the so-called trickle-down narrative or trickle-down theory about economics. So what can we say about uh, trickle-down? Well, let me just focus on two sets of uh, countries, the US and Western Europe to start with, and then I will focus on uh, uh, China and India. So here we have the US on the left, Western Europe on the right from 1980 to 2016, two indicators, um, the top 1% income share, the bottom 50% income share. What we see on this graph is that we have two regions the US, Western Europe, that are broadly similar in terms of size, in terms of population, in terms of level of development, and in terms of inequality levels in 1980. We see that the top income share and the bottom 50% income share are broad, uh, fall in the relatively similar ranges. But over the course of time, the evolution are strikingly different. In the US, is a complete inversion or almost complete inversion of the relative positions of the top 1% and of the bottom 50%. The bottom 50%, its shared national income collapses from 20% to a bit more than 10%. And at the same time, the top 1% rises to about 10% to 20%. This, was, this happened in the context of a near stagnation of bottom 50% average incomes in the US. So the bottom half, the poorest half of the American population was cut off from economic growth. Very different picture in Western Europe. What is important to have in mind here as well is that these are pre-tax incomes. This is not after redistribution. So the big gap in terms of US-Europe dynamics is not a matter, is not primarily a matter of what is happening to the fiscal and redistribution system, but it is what is happening with pre-distribution or with market incomes. And this is extremely important to have in mind when we start to think about the set of policies. And I will give a, a word on that afterwards. A uh, final point is that inequality is not about trade or technology per se. These two regions opened up in relatively similar ways to trade and to technologies over the period, but followed radically diverging pathways. Um, if we focus on um, China and India, we have relatively similar um, a similar general message even though indeed these are very different regions at very different levels of their development and with very different uh, institutional setups but similar levels of inequality in 1980 and diverging trajectories over the course of time so basically um, the opening to global markets the liberalization of the economy or at least parts of the economy can be done in very different ways and what is also interesting to see in India versus China is that if you look at the top of the top of the distribution in both countries you have very similar growth rates that being said um, at the bottom of the distribution the bottom 50% of Chinese grew four times faster than bottom 50% of Indians. So it is not because the very rich Chinese grew much, much faster than in India that the bottom 50% or the poorest Chinese grew much higher at a much higher rate than in India. The reasons needs to be fine. Uh, elsewhere, and this has a lot to do with uh, the importance of educational health investments or investments in infrastructure in rural areas in China that were not done in the same extent in, um, in India. So, 
I will uh, skip this slide, skip this slide, and I will now move on to um, this graph about the future of global inequality. Um, and what is what is presented here is the evolution of the top one percent income share from 1980 to 2016, the bottom 50% income share. And in grey here, uh, a set of possible scenarios for the future. Indeed, we don't know what the future of inequality will be like at the world level, but we can make projections. What is um, useful in this uh, in this exercise, in my sense, is that we see that if we assume that emerging countries continue to catch up, and here we're pretty optimistic, we're more optimistic than the OECD, for instance, uh, when it comes to the catch-up, the future catch-up of Africa, the future catch-up of Latin America, or Central Asia, or Southeast Asia. Um, if, we, if countries continue to distribute income growth in the same way as they've done since 1980, so business as usual, distribution of growth, but more overall growth for emerging countries in the future than in the past, well, then we still are on a continuing trend in terms of the rising global top 1% income share. Indeed, other trajectories are possible if all countries distribute growth in the same way as the US did over the past decades, the top 1% 1% income share will be even higher than uh, in the business as usual scenario, about 27% by 2050. Now, the countries can also distribute growth in a fairer way. And we see here that if uh, the European trajectory is followed, there is a slight reduction of um, the top 1% income share. But the bottom line is that between country convergence will not be sufficient to reduce global inequality or to counter the strong divergence that is happening within countries. And one of the key messages that I would like to um, have here is that between 1980 and today, we move from a world where nationality mattered slightly more than within countries uh, inequalities than class, let's put it that way, to a world where nationality matters less than income differences within countries when we try to understand global inequality between individuals. When I say that, I don't mean that there is no between country uh, inequalities anymore, but these inequalities now matter less than within country differences when we try to explain um, global inequality. I will skip these slides and conclude here by saying that with the publication of this data, we, our objective is not to make everybody agree on inequality. Uh, I had uh, more slides on uh, taxation, tax evasion, the importance of educational investments. There's no silver bullet to tackle inequality, even though that my sense there are many silver bullets. If you want to tackle the rise of incomes and wealth at the top, progressive taxation is key. But if you want to lift uh, the bottom 50% income growth, in, uh, investments in education, in education are key. And how do you finance important investments in education and universal access to education or health? Well, tax progressivity is key. So there needs to be a connection, an integration of pre-distribution uh, policies and redistribution policies like taxes. That being said, what really matters is that everybody, policymakers, media, researchers, should have access to quality information about the distribution of growth. And this is not the case at the moment. Governments should publish these statistics with the help of the United Nations. And um, this will be essential to find appropriate policy responses to these trends. The positive news is that, yes, there has been a rise of global inequality, but this rise is not a fatality. We could have organized globalization in a very different way. And the different trajectories across countries suggest that much more equitable pathways can be followed in the future. There's much more than what I said in the World Inequality Report, which is available online on wid.org.
world. Thank you very much for your attention.